Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hello, Alex. Hi, Alex. Alex. Hi, Alex. He's using those. Uh, we had some kind of questions here, and I put some. Um, What's your actual name, Doc? Yeah. Yeah, I said, um, I have some guiding questions and I will use that to... Okay. That sounds perfect. <coughs> Hello, how are you? What's your name? Can you hear me? Dice, sale. Hola. ¿Se oye bien?
Better shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Controls you. <laughs> Big brother has, is watching you. <laughs> Santiago, ¿sabes que en Portugal? ¿Sabes que en Portugal para llamar a un hijo tuyo Santiago tienes que tener una, un permiso especial? Porque, ¿Por es un, porque tenemos el nombre Tiago, solo Tiago. Ah, Tiago. Santiago no, es no había, es español. Es español. A mí, a mí me encanta. Me gusta. Bueno, gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really need one. Alex, you're my, the son of my... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Great. Thank you. Good request. I'm first. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for, uh, for joining us uh, for lunch today. And uh, welcome to CropLife International's panel session, The Next Green Revolution, How Farmers Will Feed a Warmer World. I'm Denise Dewar, Executive Director for Plant Biotechnology at CropLife International. And on behalf of, our, of the plant science industry and our co-hosts here today, Truth About Trade and Technology and Farming, and Farming First, and our hosts who could not be here due to the government shutdown, the U.S. <laughs> Department of Foreign Agricultural Services, and the U.S. State Department, I'd like to welcome you to today's Farmer Roundtable. Worldwide, we are increasingly seeing the impacts of climate change on food security. In North America, the United States experienced its worst drought in 25 years last year. American farmers stood by helpless as entire fields withered and crop yields dropped to their lowest in over a decade. In Africa, where farmers often don't have access to the latest agricultural tools and technologies, unpredictable and catastrophic weather in regions such as the Sahel have created a recurring cycle of poor harvests and devastating food security crises. In Latin America, Argentine farmers have experienced two droughts in the last five years, one of which was the worst seen in 70 years. These extreme weather changes over the last, last few years have made it abundantly clear that no region of the world is immune to the impacts of climate change. Smallholder farmers, as well as the breadbaskets of the world, are equally at risk for significant productivity losses, which will be devastating to our world's growing population. Extreme climates, drought, increasing world prop population, shrinking natural resources. Our farmers have a lot of obstacles ahead of them. But they also have lots of opportunities. For millennia, our world's population has always found a way to grow <coughs> food. Agriculture is the most resilient and innovative industry of all time. New agricultural innovations and tools enabled by plant biotechnology such as drought-tolerant seeds and no-till practices are enabling farmers to better respond to more unpredictable weather patterns. Biotech crops allow farmers to maintain better consistent crop productivity and quality and even increase yields despite new pressures from in increased insect populations, shorter rainy seasons, and hardier weeds. Plant biotechnology has also had a significant impact on how farmers feed this world, which is why the World Food Prize is honoring three plant biotech pioneers as this year's World Food Prize laureates. Doctors Mary Dell Chilton, Rob Fraley, and Mark Van Montague's research has resulted in a technology which in just 17 short years has been planted on 1.5 
billion acres by tens of millions of farmers in 30 countries, making plant biotechnology the fastest adopted agricultural technology in history. The reason for this is simple. It helps farmers adapt. By building a crop's resilience to insect and weeds pressures, plant biotechnology allows growers to focus on reacting to the new challenges posed by climate change. Today's panel of farmers is familiar with the challenges of reacting to climate change firsthand and understand how new in innovations, including those produced through biotechnology, can help. Their farms span Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Europe, and they spent much of their lives working to adapt and evolve with a growing world and a changing environment. I look forward to hearing their experiences and better understanding what they need to improve farming in the face of climate change. I'd also like to introduce our moderator today, Julie Borlaug. Julie is the Assistant Director of Partnerships at the Norman Borlaug Institute for International Agriculture at Texas A&M University, and she's also the granddaughter of Norman Borlaug. It's a real honor to have Julie with us to moderate this session. Please join me in welcoming Julie. Good afternoon. Um, before we start, I just want to let you know that each one of our farmers is going to speak and then we're going to have a question answer session. So please be thinking of some engaging questions that you would like to answer, to ask some of the farmers. Um, um, I really appreciate being here with you today. If there was any panel that my grandfather would be most interested to attend, this would be it. Everyone knows his love of farmers, his actual last words really were, take it to the farmer. He knew if we provided farmers with the best technology inputs that we would never have, no child would ever have to go hungry again. So it's truly an honor to be here with farmers from all over the world and I thank you also for your support for them. So I think we're going to go ahead and start and we're going to start with Devorn. So would you please introduce yourself and give a little background. Thank you. I am Daibon Chibonga. I am a farmer, but uh, most importantly, I head the National Smallholder Farmers Association of Malawi, which comprises more than 100,000 individual members, most of them working on less than two hectares of land, but they've been organized and mobilized to take farming as business, and they are working in 45 associations in Malawi. I have a PowerPoint presentation. I'll just go through that. I've already said what we are as NASFA. Uh, in terms of the roles that we play as NASFAM is to represent the needs and interests of smallholder farmers, to build their capacity to take farming as business, because a lot of farmers in, Mala in Malawi and other countries in Africa are just uh, subsistence farmers. We facilitate acquisition of productive inputs from feed, seed, fertilizers, crop protection products, equipment, technology, and extension, and we facilitate the provision of markets. We think we've got it right and we are heading the right direction because in 2009, we won the Yara Prize for a Green Revolution in Africa. Thank you. Some of the challenges that farmers are facing in feeding a warming world is that a lot of smallholder farmers have got a subsistence mindset. They're only producing enough food, if anything, to feed themselves. But because of various challenges that they face, they are not even able to feed themselves. More than 50% of smallholder farmers across the world are actually not food secure. There's a lack of conducive policy environment, lack of access, and also the, the actual price of productive inputs and technologies and climate change. Because a lot of farmers are depending on rain-fed agriculture with the they result that uh, they are not producing as much as they should from any given uh, area of land. Nowadays, we are experiencing shorter duration of the growing season. Uh, there is increasing occurrences of floods and drought, and there is resurgence of pests and diseases, and pests <coughs> includes weeds here. A lot of post harvest losses, I think it has been estimated that more than 30 to 40 percent of anything that farmers are producing is actually lost post-harvest and access to processing and markets. 
What are the solutions that we are looking at in terms of feeding a warming world? Adoption of policies and plans that combine intensification with sustainable solutions and focusing on food security needs of people. I think people talk about the triple win in terms of income, in terms of people, and in terms of also the environment. There needs to be increased financial support for global and domestic research and innovation to develop and identify suitable technologies and processes. There needs also to be greater emphasis on ensuring that inputs and credit are accessible and that the rights to land and water are secure for African smallholder farmers. We need increased investments in the rural agricultural market systems and linkages that support the spread and demand for sustainable intensification. A lot of times we talk about markets being pro poor, but we don't provide the enabling environment that helps smallholder farmers to access those markets. We need technologies such as the genetic modification of living organisms and the use of cloned livestock and nanotechnology that should not be excluded as priori on ethical or moral grounds. Though there is a need to respect the views of people who have counter review. The biggest challenge is that people talk and they don't listen. So one side talks about their own situation as scientists and so on, and they don't listen to what the farmers and the consumers are saying. The consumers are only talking about safety and so on. They are not listening to what the scientists say. So we need to be able to talk and to listen to each other. The human and environmental safety of any new technology needs to be rigorously established before its deployment, with, and it should be open and transparent transparent in decision making. And there needs to be adoption of climate mitigation and adaptation as key to securing steady sources of food and income for billions of people. It troubles me to find that you go to international forum and one school of thought is just talking about adaptation and another school of thought is just talking about mitigation. We think it's a package, you need to be talking about both mitigation and adaptation. In Nasram, we believe that the future belongs to the organized. As an individual, as a family, as a country, as farmers, if you're not organized, then you have no future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Well, my name is Santiago del Solar. I'm a farmer from Argentina. And I'm really very proud of being here, sharing this panel with my colleagues and having a moderator like Julie. And I want to thank CropLife for this invitation. Well, first of all, I want to show you where I do come from. I told you I come from Argentina. Oh, this <coughs> Next one. No. No. Something's going uh, wrong. Arrow down. Arrow? Yes. Down. This arrow? No. Here? No. Yes, again. This one. This one? Yes. Here? Yeah. Look. <laughs> That's where I come from. See, Argentina is on top of the world, oh. as you <laughs> may know. We come from there. <laughs> Took me a long time to come here, but we are very proud of being there. <laughs> we have been always been there. <laughs> well, my farm. My farm is in that Buenos is Aires province, <laughs> at the west of Buenos Aires province. It's the Pampas region, and it's 95 meters above sea level. But we are 430 kilometers from the sea. So when we have floods there, it's very difficult to drain those lands. You see there, there's a river over there that's very far away. It's called the Salado River. So in that region, when we have floods, we really suffer them. I have some records of my farm since 1923, the five-year average rain. As you see there, maybe we have some years with more rain, less rain. It's less than 100 years. And the average rain there is 819 millimeters. So that's not bad. But as you, but as you know, averages, they never happen. We don't have never averages. 2009, we had 672 millimeters. That was a big drought. Last year, 1,451 millimeters in my farm. 
oh. there was a big flood. Look at the floods. That's the way look to, to get inside my farm or get out during last November. It was really tough. We don't have enough infrastructure in Argentina. Look at the drought, soybean field. And that's not a problem of my farm alone. You see the, the, the grain production in Argentina. You can see 2008 and 2009, <coughs> it dropped dramatically because the drought was all over the country. And then the last year, because of floods, also came down the production. Well, we'll try to mitigate the impact of this situation. How do we do this from a farmer's perspective? First of all, no till, that's very important. Before you used to ha have plows, and when you plow the land, you put the land this way, you put it that way. That's crazy, crazy thing to do. We don't do it anymore. Crop rotation, biotechnology, pesticides and stewardship, very important stewardship. We have regulations, but every day we are there. We are the guardians that things may happen properly. We have, you may have any regulation, but if the important is to farmers be conscious and do a stewardship program. And also precision agriculture that is growing each year. This is about no-till. That's in my farm. A month ago, we were planting corn, and you see all the stubble and protection that you have in the soil. That's good for infiltration and help us to control erosion, soil erosion. If you compare conventional tillage versus no-till, we use 33 less fossil energy, and we reduce 70% erosion risk. That's a big difference. No till area in Argentina grew very fast. If you see, when we started with glyphosate resistance in 1997, it was much easier for, for us to implement no till technology. So we are today 80% in Argentina of no till technology. This is a picture of my farm last December. We were harvesting corn. The usual harvesting corn season is April. That corn was waiting there in the middle of the floods and in the wind yeah. till December. Why? How? Well, we prayed a lot, of course, but the important thing, it was BT corn. Before, with the floods and winds, in one month, two months, all the corn, not all the corn, but maybe 30% or 40% of the corn would be on the floor and lost. That is an extreme situation. It doesn't happen often. <laughs> but we can delay right now because of BT corn, our um, harvest. I will talk about a little bit of Christmas in the Pampas with Biotech. We have 100 degrees Fahrenheit in Christmas time, and we do eat the same kind of food that you eat here, but with that temperature, and we drink almost as you drink in Christmas time. I said almost. <laughs> And in that situation, we have silking of corn. That's the most important part of the cycle of corn. If it doesn't rain there, in those days we are praying for Christmas and praying for rain too. If it doesn't rain, yields drop down. But today, if you go to the Pampas, you can see both pictures. You can see silking and at the same time, corn in delayed planting. Why we can do that? We couldn't do that before, diversifying risk, because the amount of insects with that temperatures would destroy the corn. The number of generations would destroy the corn. We couldn't do that. We have to plant earlier. Now, with BT corn and other traits that help us, we can do that, and we diversify risk. That is very important. Before, it was a single bullet. If it didn't rain Christmas, no yields. Now, we are diversifying risks because of BT corn. How to learn to use a new technology? Once I heard that there's one dollar for each individual who presents an innovative idea, for example, a new technology. But the big money, the $19, is for the person who successfully implements that idea. That was said by Peter Drucker. So, how would you implement technology in Argentina? Those are my friends. They come once a year to my farm 
we work in farmers groups. The, the most guarded secret of Argentinian agriculture is farmers groups. And the secret is that we don't have secrets between farmers. We share information. Those guys, when they visit me, they have numbers of questions. Then they exchange experiences and ideas, and they help me to be a better farmer. And next month, I will visit their farms and so on. And that's the way that technology spreads in Argentina. We also hire professional advisors. We farmers hire them. And they help us with technical information to be a better farmer. Well, yes, farmers can feed the world, of course. But better seeds and fertilizers, and not romantic meat, will let them do it. That was said by Norman Burlock. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is it good afternoon or good morning? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My name is Gilbert Bohr. I'm a farmer from Kenya, a small scale farmer. I'm also a lecturer at the Catholic University of Eastern Africa in my hometown of Eldoret, where I teach business. I'm also a leader of farm organizations, cooperatives, and an opinion writer. I write opinion on how we can improve food security in the world. And I focus on uh, biotechnology and other technologies that farmers should get to improve their production and um, contribute to food security in the world. Now, Kenya is a country in East Africa. Um, it is basically an agricultural country, although only 20% of the country <coughs> is arable. And therefore, we are often food insecure. We have to import food from other countries. And many times, we have famines in many parts of the country. So, um, we have to advocate for use of technology to improve food production in the country. We have to advocate for farmer organizations so that <coughs> farmers can receive the technology. And dealing with the question of what is the potential role of GE technology in helping to fight climate change, my answer is GE technology has a positive role to play in fighting climate change. Because if farmers use what we have just had, not till, it means with Shorter rains, less moisture, you don't have to disturb the soil. It means with use of um, genetically modified um, seeds, which can withstand uh, less moisture, farmers will still be able to produce even more. So I would say that uh, GE will lead to development of crops that will adapt to the changing climate. <coughs> GE also will provide capabilities for higher yielding crop varieties, leading to the ability of farmers to feed the teeming populations of the world. Genetically modified crops 
also will lead to specialization so that farmers can produce what they can produce in their particular climatic regions. And that should lead to getting farmers to be aware and diversify their crops so that they can produce crops which um, go along with the changing climate. Um, genetically modified crops will also help the farmers to fight climate change or to adapt to <coughs> climate change. I'm talking about adaptation and, and, and mitigation. Um, because farmers will use less fuel to produce more food. Farmers will use less fertilizers to produce more food. Farmers will use um, less herbicides because of insect tolerant um, crops which do not require the use of herbicides to, um, to kill the insects. And that leads to um, sustainability. And that leads to a better environment with less <coughs> chemicals going into the water. There are many things we can talk about, but I want to um, end by saying, today I just got a message from um, our um, forum. Um, stakeholder forum on biotechnology that the government of Kenya has set up a task force to examine the safety of um, uh, um, G foods. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, I'm going to, to give my comments when I get back. And I'm sure that within, within the year, we should get the government of Kenya allowing uh, the cro growing of. Uh, GE crops in the country. We have already had trials which are going on and, uh, and, and all we are waiting for is the government policy to say yes, let us give it to the farmers like Dr. Bolov said. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ravi Chandran, farmer from India, Tamil Nadu. I'm a third generation farmer. I have been cultivating a variety of crops like uh, paddy, sugarcane, cotton, and pulses. It is my great privilege to take part in this uh, crucial discussion during the centenary year of uh, Dr. Norman Borlaug, who lives in the hearts of millions of farmers like me. I salute this legendary personality, the, Dr. Norman Borlaug, who saved over a billion lives. Thanks to the great uh, visionaries like uh, uh, Sri C. Subramaniam, Bharat Ratna C. C. Subramaniam, the then uh, Minister for Agriculture, Union Minister for Agriculture in India, Dr. scientists like Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, the architect of uh, Green Revolution in India. Uh, thousands of uh, extension workers and millions of uh, uh, farmers, they helped in restoring our self-esteem. Prior to the Green Revolution, we were uh, leading rather a ship-to-mouth survival. Our farmers created history by transforming our nation, which was heavily depending on food imports to feed its population, which was less than 45% uh, uh, of the percent population, into a self-sufficient nation. While rejoicing the success of uh, Green Revolution, uh, we should remember that uh, we cannot uh, sit on our past laurels and be complacent. Our challenges are many and uh, complex in nature. The arable land area is uh, shrinking, our water resources are depleting, there is an exodus of farmhands from villages to towns, and uh, younger generation, they are not uh, very keen in taking up farming as a carrier. If you go to any village, you can rarely come across a farmer who is less than 40 years old. Even if you are lucky enough to find one, you will soon realize that uh, he is a farmer not by choice, by default. This is the gloomy situation prevailing in our country. We are unable to sustain upon the meager income that we get from our 
small land holding because of the fragmented land holding and divided land holding pattern in India. And there is uh, 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 ever increasing uh, cost of cultivation. The minimum support price we are getting is not adequate enough to provide uh, enough margin for us. So these are the problems. And besides, we face the problem of uh, biotic stress factors like uh, pest disease and weeds. And uh, last but not the least, the adverse impact of climate change on agriculture is a matter of great concern to us. With these constraints, we have to produce more food to feed our growing population. According to uh, one estimate, uh, we have to increase our food production at least by 50% uh, to feed a population during in, by, the, by the year 2035. The challenge becomes even more uh, uh, complex due to the impending glo global warming. For Indian farmers, the impact of climate change would be more severe as most of the lands are under rain-fed condition and the success or failure of uh, farming would depend on monsoon. We face either excess or deficient rainfall as a routine feature year after year. Last year we faced rather a uh, drought-like condition. This year, as you might have seen, the, the uh, Himalayan tsunami which uh, submerged a lot of uh, crops. Even uh, so last week uh, we had uh, uh, cyclone and uh, uh, cyclone in, uh, in uh, Odisha, Korea. So instead of uh, uh, taking remedial measures uh, uh, after the damage has been inflicted, we should get. We, sh we should get ready to adapt to the new, farm, uh, new farming conditions we will be exposed to. We should direct our research to study the possibility of uh, new pest regimen, new diseases, and study the performance of crop by simulating the global warming model. I do not know whether any uh, simulation model for global warming has been done or not. So, I mean, I, uh, certainly it would help us in the long run. Besides, we should look into the possibility of uh, See, when, there, when we talk about challenges, opportunity follows. So besides, uh, we should look into the possibility of cultivating other, uh, other types of crops uh, different from the conventional ones that would fit into the new environment. And now let us come to the solution. We must adopt all uh, possible solutions, all possible uh, technologies to combat the challenges we might face. In this respect, I would like to uh, mention about uh, specific, specific reference about uh, one technology which has benefited uh, millions of farmers, including small farmers like me. Yes, I'm talking about this uh, uh, GM crops. GM crop has immense potential to address many of our biotic and abiotic uh, yield reducing stress factors. This powerful tool must be used uh, to develop and breed uh, uh, climate resilient crops. We need uh, uh, drought resistant crop, as he was mentioning, flood resistant, uh, flood, uh, flood tolerant crop, uh, we need salinity tolerant crop, uh, so the list is endless. We need uh, 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 plants that could uh, use nitrogen more efficiently and biotechnology could uh, provide very good solution for such problems. And uh, coming to the uh, policy, the policy decision by our government, so I appeal through this media, We cannot afford to reject biotechnology on emotional grounds. That decisions regarding uh, GM crops must be taken on scientific merits, not on the basis of political science. So as a cotton farmer, BT cotton farmer, I would like to share some of my experience. So, so BT cotton is the only GM crop that is allowed to be grown in India. Our farmers may be poor. Our farmers may not have far formal education, but they are wise enough to understand, distinguish between uh, what is uh, suitable and what, what benefits him and what doesn't benefit him. If the technology uh, doesn't suit to him, he will, uh, he will not hesitate to show the exit gate, even the, if the technology is provided free of cost. On the other hand, if it really suits him, he will roll out the uh, red carpet to welcome such technology, as in the case of uh, BT cotton. See, the, the, see, in India, more than 94% of the cotton grown in India or BT cotton stands as a testimony to the robustness of the technology and the wholehearted acceptance of the technology. 
So let us adopt uh, any technology that is beneficial to us. In fact, we should adopt uh, 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 integrated approach uh, while selecting the technology. On behalf of the uh, rest of the farmers in our country, I, uh, I, uh, I promise that uh, we can drive away hunger and malnutrition permanently from the planet, provided we are given the right technology. What would be the challenge? We, will, we can feed the world. So next uh, green revolution is certainly it is going to be a gene revolution. Well, thank you for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Gosh, it's, it's hard to walk on high heels. Being a farmer, I'm not very used to it. <laughs> so uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Gabriela Cruz. I am an agronomist. I am the third of four sisters. So you can imagine how annoyed my father was by everybody in town saying that who is going to take care of, take care of the farm if you only have girls. And he, if he was alive, he would be uh, the same age as, as Mr. Borlo. Uh, he would always reply, one of the girls. And the people would say, oh, no, no. Women can never give orders to men. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've been managing the farm for the last 24 years. I enjoy very much being a farmer. I have no children, but I have three nephews. In Portugal, my country, we face very often severe droughts. Soils are poor. We have a lot of erosion. We, in my area, we have 450 millimeters of rain per year, and we have very hot summers. What do I produce? I produce cereals, mainly wheat, barley, and corn. I produce clover for seed, lupinus for feed, sunflower, and I have livestock for beef. And I'm looking for alternative profitable crops to have a more effective rotation with its benefits. What does Europe expect from me? To be a superwoman, which I'm already, I'm, I'm already, because <laughs> <laughs> just because I am a farmer. Um, so Europe wants me to practice a sustainable farming, which means to produce safe food, feed and services to the community while protecting natural resources and remaining profitable. So what exactly is Europe and global economy asking me? To reduce water consumption, to reduce energy consumption, fuel and electricity, to reduce nitrogen and phosphate consumption, to reduce <coughs> pesticide use, to reduce erosion, and to reduce gas emissions. So what tools did I choose to answer to Europe requests and for economical reasons. I chose to change the irrigation system from flooding to center pivot. I chose to um, grow some few conventional crops and I have to use agrochemicals to produce them and I choose to practice integrated pest management I chose to use no-till and strip-till, mm -hmm. a biotech no, crop, the only one I'm allowed to grow, to which is Bt corn. I chose to anticipate my planting dates and varieties within crops with shorter cycle. And I had to choose biodiverse pastures, which means combining legumes with graminae in order to sequester uh, carbon. 
Why is Europe asking all of this? To some extent because it does not have any idea of what farming is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, because studies are indicated, indicating evident climate change due to a great extent of human contribution. So in Portugal it is expected that temperature will increase, rainfall will decrease, there will be more often, even more often, droughts and heat waves, that rain in fall has been increasing while it has been decreasing in spring. And it, it is expected that more, more erosion and a loss on soil fertility, which means less crop productivity or yields. So what did I achieve uh, with what I chose, with the tools I chose? Some of the aspects uh, the, or the tools I chose already mitigate and contribute to mitigate the climate change. So I was able to, redu to reduce water consumption about 10%. With no-till and strip-till, I could reduce erosion, water and energy consumption. I'll give you some figures. 25,000 liters of fuel per year. 50% of uh, the electricity I could reduce. And I could reduce 65 tons per year of carbon emission. What could I achieve with BT corn? A reduction on the use of insecticide against corn borer, 400 to 600 liters per year. And I could reduce water consumption for insecticide application of about 75,000 liters per year. We, it's, with integrated pest management, I could reduce the use of pesticides. So I don't do pre preventive treatments, I do curative treatments. I could reduce water consumption on uh, pesticide application, and I could reduce on fuel consumption and uh, carbon emissions. But what, are, what else do I need for the future to mitigate the climate change and to answer to all these requirements from Europe? I need continuing to reduce water and energy consumption. CAP, Common Agriculture Policy, is asking us to reduce 20% of water, water consumption in our farms. I need to reduce more pesticide use I need to reduce nitrogen and phosphate use, and I need to reduce carbon emissions. What do I already have to fulfill those objectives? I have genetics. I have biotech and non-biotech crops. And I have equipment. But what else do I still need and have to do. I need genetics for, uh, to reduce the water consumption. So I already have, I'm not allowed, but I, I could have the possibility of use biotech crops to reduce uh, the water consumption, uh, I mean the drought tolerance. I need more uh, biotech crops to reduce pesticide use, like uh, herbicide, herbicide tolerant uh, crops. And I need a biotech crop, or I need genetics to reduce nitrogen and uh, phosphate uh, use. So, what is my turn to ask Europe? I think I have, the, I have the right to ask Europe many things. Two very important ones. Freedom of choice for farmers to choose 
which technology better suits. And I ask you that all the decisions are made uh, by science-based um, decisions. I have the pleasure and the honor to work with one of the laureates tomorrow, Dr. Mark Montague, and we are struggling in Europe for this freedom of choice for farmers and science-based decisions. So let us thank all the scientists and let us farmers feed the world. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. I think we should give a round of applause to our farmers. That was amazing. Thank you. feel my grandfather in here. He, he champions everything you all are doing. We are going to move into the portion of question and answer session. Um, Alex over here has the microphone, so we'll begin with our first question, but please let him get to you so everyone in the room can hear the question. So who would like to go first? Or I know a lot of you in the audience, and I will call you out <laughs> if I need to. <laughs> all right, and will you just give us your name and... Um, what organization you represent? Hi, I'm Angela Hansen from Dahlberg Global Development Advisors. I'm based in Johannesburg, but originally from Iowa. Uh, I wanted to, to call out the optimism that I heard uh, from our Kenyan colleague about uh, Kenyan policies and, and perhaps direct a question to Dyborn as a result, uh, because I know he's an active stakeholder in the Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Program, as I've seen him in many, many meetings associated with CADAP. I'd like to hear just a little bit from your perspective on how the policy landscape across Africa is evolving as many uh, national governments are uh, quite creating quite difficult environments for some of the crops and technologies that we're talking about today. So if you could just give some perspective on the evolution of, of policy making and policy thinking around some of the interventions we've discussed. Okay, I thought we were going to take a few questions. All right, uh, in terms of policy direction, a lot of African countries are actually looking to the future of technology to solve the problems of feeding their populations and feeding the world. Uh, what is happening is that they are talking to the scientists, the farmers, the private sector to come up with the policies and to come up with laws that will protect uh, the consumers. In the case of Malawi, for example, we were uh, about five years ago, we started talking about uh, GM policy. But as the groups met, we said the GM policy is not enough. It has to be a biotechnology policy. And we came up with that about three years ago. And trials have now started on GM cotton at Bunda College, which is uh, one of the agriculture colleges. And that's happening across Africa, where they are coming up with the policies and laws that are going to protect consumers as people are implementing uh, technology in terms of their production systems. Thank you. <coughs> uh, let me, uh, on the Kenyan perspective, um, in 2012, as a result of the Serelini publication, the government of Kenya um, banned the importation of uh, GM foods. Mm. But we have been agitating for removal of that ban. And that's why today I've, I've said I got a message that the government has formed a task force to look into safety of uh, GM foods uh, with a view to advising the government to remove that ban. Um, as for the growing of crops, there have been trials by the Kenya Agricultural Research Institute. There are uh, closed trials and also field trials. But the government has yet to uh, to, 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 to give a positive uh, way forward for the growing of uh, GM crops. But I'm, uh, I know that uh, very soon they, 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 they will do that, and I know that they, they will go into, they, they are likely to, to start with cotton or non-food crops, uh, after which when the, the population sees the benefit of using um, or the benefits of using uh, uh, biotech 
in growing such crops like cotton, then eventually uh, the government will also allow food crops uh, probably beginning with May. That is the situation as far as I know. I'm not a scientist. I hope, uh, I hope we have a Kenyan scientist around here. Do we? Maybe, yeah, maybe you can assist me. Thank you. Um, my name is Charity Motegi. I just wanted to add to what uh, he has said. Uh, Kenya now has a national biosafety <coughs> authority that is uh, in place and is helping uh, research towards uh, some of these commodities. So it is in place and it has made uh, the environment for research on GM uh, much easier. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have an additional question? My name is Albert. I work for Sunland Life Weekly, which is a weekly publication based in Beijing. My question is, is for the our lady here. I forgot your name. Uh, you mentioned the uh, farmer's right. I agree with you 100%. But as we, we all know, we have to fight for our rights. So have you ever considered doing some kind of a demonstration, you know, or anything that Greenpeace are doing to, to <laughs> fight for your rights? <laughs> Well, uh, demonstrations we haven't considered yet. But I can tell you that uh, we do a lot of um, information to the European institutions, for example, of how damaging can be those decisions of, uh, um, or those destructions of fields, or this, those decisions of not allowing some trades to be um, able to be, um, produced in some countries. So we have um, day to day in our uh, network with Dr. Montague, which is called Farmers and Scientists Network. We have a day to day uh, job to um, tell, uh, you know, politicians and uh, policy makers uh, of the importance of um, some technologies. And um, tomorrow, uh, there will be a letter from our group to all the, the uh, presidents of the European institutions uh, telling them how damaging can be for Europe and for other countries in Asia and Africa the fact that Europe does not allow um, those trades to be, um, or those events to be produced. Uh, but mm, to be honest, we haven't considered any demonstration yet. Hmm. Hmm. Any additional questions? We have one in the back. Hi. Um, I wanted to pose a question to practically almost all the panel. I'm from Tanzania. I am from the bad side of the argument. I am a politician, the Deputy Minister for Agriculture and Food Security of Tanzania. Uh, I no longer like to use the politician. I use policy contractor now because <laughs> <laughs> everybody is against politicians now. For the lady from Portugal, the issue of whether we go for GM or not, especially in the developing world, is no longer about science. All of you have spoken as if people are challenging the scientific argument. It's about science versus, as you said, political science. And I want to, to ask you, because I sit down in a panel, you were just speaking about my Kenyan minister colleagues, and I'm telling you, she spoke about the biosafety framework in Kenya. They're taking it from the biosafety framework in Tanzania. And the Malawians are doing it. And we meet in all these kind of forums. And the Africans are not ready to bring in bio, uh, GMO, GM crops, not because we have arguments of ourselves, 
but because we are taking arguments from the European bloc. Yeah. That is true. the reality of the situation. That's true. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself, we have activism from Europe coming into Africa mm -hmm. and saying, don't do this, don't do that. <laughs> and some of it is so terrible because I know when I stood up in parliament and said, I'm voting for GMO, I was castigated as the devil. <laughs> Why? Because by using GMO maize, you get a tail on the behind and plus. <laughs> 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 and I, all I want to say is, where is the science where, where, when GMO is being castigated? Where, where are the scientific arguments? And as a result, what I, what I, I, I just still don't want to understand. I don't want to, to I want to understand why is it, you see this gentleman there, please stand up, please stand up. Professor there, he took a whole Tanzanian delegation, he's the head of BT Cotton something to, in Burkina Faso. We went there, he took us to Bobo Dialoso. We come back to East Africa, we can still pull BT Cotton because by using BT Cotton on the farms, you're going to, um, <coughs> it has negative effects on the manhood of, of men. <laughs> and that is a big oh. argument when it comes to the African man. So I'm saying, if we have all this scenario, the science is all there. The political framework you're talking of, the biosafety framework is there. I'm asking myself, and all the scientific field is in here. It's not about the farmer's freedom to choose because politics does not give you the freedom to choose. <laughs> I want you to tell me whether you don't agree with me that it's all about economics and somewhere along the line, Europe is not comfortable yet with the economic nature of having GMO as a widespread um, argument because the, the health, environmental, and et cetera, et cetera arguments, I can't see any. I just want to know whether the science is not taking its rightful position into defending what they're creating. Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. That was wonderful. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I agree with you. I agree with you. To some extent, I agree with you. But the problem is that the consumer does not want GMOs. If the consumer does not want GMOs, how do you convince the consumer? You just tell him, well, there's no, there's no risk with GMOs. And he asks me, but who told you that? And I have to answer, a scientist. Many scientists, thousands of scientists, have said that there's no risk with GMOs. If, I take to, if you have to take a medicine, or, or if you recommend, or somebody recommends a medicine to take because of a disease, the person wants to be sure that the medicine is safe. And how do you prove that the medicine is safe? By the work of the scientists. So you, can't, you have consumers that come to me and say, oh, you know, if you, uh, if you eat GMOs, you will lose your reasoning. And I say, but where, where the, does that come from? Do you have any scientist who's, who said that? I mean, you, can't, uh, you have to be based on something. And science is probably the, mo the most solid thing. To, co to convince the consumers. Because in, in Europe is the consumer who decides what the, pol the politicians are going to do. Why do you have, I don't, I don't have anything against the politicians. So don't feel, um, <laughs> <laughs> but why, have you realized that some, in some countries, GMOs are banned when elections are closed? So how, you, how do you convince consumers? You have to tell them that scientists have su studied the subject and science say that, are, that GMOs are safe. I don't see any other, any other way. I perceive it uh, more as a, uh, a politics in the, as far as the European Union is concerned. It is more of a political uh, rather than science. So recently, I read, a, read an article that uh, read a news item 
that uh, uh, the French court allowed uh, a GM trial, but whereas the particular, I don't remember his name, that particular minister, uh, French minister, he said that he would uh, amend the law to, uh, to ban, to, uh, to put moratorium on such trials. So this is what happening in Europe, and everybody quotes Europe uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, ban uh, GM crops. Um, <clears throat> I want to agree with the gentleman from Tanzania that um, the consumers in Africa have not said no to GM food. It is the, the politics from Europe, and they, 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 there's a lot of myth which is bandied in, in, in that part of the, of the world that if you allow the growing of uh, biotech crops, in Kenya, for example, you are going to lose the market in Europe for your flowers. You will, do, you will lose the market in Europe for your tea. You lose the market in Europe for coffee and other crops that are exported. But the issues are not really about the consumers and are about science. The issues are about politics from Europe. And this is why... Um, in Africa, we are talking about trading among African countries. Most of the trade uh, between African countries is greater than any trade with Europe. Yeah. And therefore, um, our, our politicians, our farmers, and our scientists have a task to, to, to talk to the, to get the government to accept to change the policy and trade among themselves. And in East Africa, we now have the East African community of nearly 140 million people, the five countries of Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. When trading among themselves will reduce the fear among exporters of other products that they will lose a market in Europe. And if we go ahead and introduce BT crops in our countries, the Europeans who buy our, those, those products of flour, tea, and coffee will have no option. In any case, those crops are not BT. They are conventional crops. What we are talking about BT is crops like cotton hmm. and food crops, because we are talking about food security. And we talk, when we talk about food crops, we are talking about maize, what you call corn here. We are talking about wheat and rice, but they are still a long way. The very first one that I know that will, will come up in stream is maize. But we have to uh, change the mindset of the people in, in Africa and the politicians so that they shut out the politics from Europe and do their own thing. Yes, I feel that many countries are losing a lot of time, wasting time. We in Argentina, we have been on both sides of the road. Know about GMOs, but before we didn't adopt, for example, hybrids, corn hybrids. And in those days, the gap between our yields and the American yields became double. Then we could catch up. Right now I see if you don't adopt this country, don't adopt GMOs and new technologies, you're losing time and life is too short. Another thing that I want to mention that I see people that sometimes they believe something and it's okay to believe something. I have my own beliefs about many things, religion, whatever. And those beliefs are for me, so I keep it for myself. But if I try to impose what I do believe to others, then I get into trouble. The same is for biotech. People believe it's wrong, but maybe they can keep that for them, but not try to impose that to other countries and don't let, let them develop as they can with those tools. Thank you, it's a very pertinent question and uh, the information I have is that Europe, instead of saying no to GMO, they've now relaxed a little bit and said as long as you label it properly so that consumers have a choice. Uh, I think uh, it is an Antarctic barrier, 
and it's something that we should be taking to the WTO, but you know what has happened to the WTO with the Doha Development Round. So as the Africans, as my brother from Kenya said, let's look at trading within Africa. Let's break down the policies that are preventing us doing that. Let's bring in the customs union that will prevent uh, material from moving across borders. And let's make sure that we have got infrastructure that makes it cost effective to trade within Africa. Right now, it costs uh, much less to bring in maize to hungry countries in Africa from outside of Africa than it is from uh, just to cross the, the border and bring it from the next door neighbor. So if we can work on those while Europe is sorting out its problems, I think we'll get uh, miles ahead. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Oh, and then all of you want to start asking questions. <laughs> Why does it work that way? <laughs> Thank you. My name is Bharat. I'm from Texas A&M University. My question is for Ravi Chandran. Ravi Chandran said, like, Indian farmers are ready to accept new technologies. I know that, but even though you accepted BT cotton, you rejected BT brinjal. BT brinjal? OK. Yeah. My question is, <coughs> I know many, it's many for former leader, leader, leaders who are misleading farmers that if you buy BT Brinjal or if you buy seed from the, some companies, you end up in debts. And how can we convince farmers that for every quarter you spend, you get one, one dollar returns back? How can we do that one? And that's my question. See, as far as uh, BT Brinjal is concerned, <laughs> again, it is uh, more of uh, political in nature. Actually, uh, the, you must be knowing there is a moratorium uh, imposed on uh, field trials. So our prime minister, he is for this technology. Our agriculture minister, he is for the technology. And even recently, Pranav Mukherjee ji, he, uh, he vouched in favor of the technology. It is the decision of one single ministry, that is Ministry of <coughs> Environment and Forest. Uh, it's uh, rather, uh, uh, there is no scientific reason behind uh, putting that moratorium. I deposed before the technical expert committee. But I uh, tried to explain the farmer's point of view there were about 17 pre, um, uh, member of parliaments uh, attending that meet. When I started explaining to them, uh, many of them, they were talking in cell phone. Some of them, they went out. And uh, we, I mean, our uh, voice becomes uh, feeble uh, when activists make a lot of, handful of activists. I don't say uh, uh, many people are behind uh, uh, such uh, uh, activist group. Only handful of activists, they are watching for us. And uh, they make, uh, uh, they are cacophonic uh, uh, activists. Our voice becomes uh, feeble. Actually, farmers are for this technology. See, as I said, more than 90% or now more than 92% of our uh, uh, cotton or BT cotton, in spite of the fact that uh, uh, the uh, stiff resistance against uh, this technology, more than 92% of our farmers, we embrace this technology. See, farmers are for the technology. If the technology is good enough, Certainly, we will uh, take the technology. If, it is, if we are not convinced about the technology, certainly we will just uh, throw it out. Only thing, see, see these uh, 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 anti-science activists, they create uh, myths in the minds of the people, so through the media. Actually, this is, I'm sorry to say, this, it is only the urban elites, not the rural people. We know the benefits of the technology. And urban elites, they, be, they are being carried away by such rumors, the, such uh, rumor mumbo. <coughs> there are few people, they are, they are like virus. They uh, so, uh, create sort of uh, rumor, and uh, see these uh, uh, urban elites. They tweet and uh, they uh, use the social media. And in fact, if you look at them, if you uh, I, I have asked uh, some of them, uh, they never uh, visited a farm. So they make uh, they are opinion makers. So it is the sorry state. It is not the uh, farmers who are opposing it. Farmers are for the technology, and uh, any technology that is good enough, uh, uh, certainly we will uh, accept such technology. Well, we want to thank all of you for coming today. Um, you know, my grandfather said, take it to the farmer, but I think he'd also say, listen to the farmer. So if all of us in this room could take what we have heard and help push the issue of biotechnology, and most importantly, choices, it's the farmer's choice. So I thank you for coming. I thank our um, farmers. And um, the Borlaug Dialogue will start shortly, so thank you. Great. Pleasure. Yeah. Ali? It's been wonderful.
for the photo. Thank you. Me encantó tu presentación, Muy profunda, aparte de que no tiene tiempo, te en la cabeza. Porque hago mucho.